This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 728, recorded on March 5th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. And it's a sterling day out. I mean, it's a wonderful, it's a little cold. Uh, it was windier yesterday, but today it's an absolutely perfect March day. And I, I'm, you know, it's just uplifting just to see such a nice sunshiny day. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. 74 degrees, mostly sunny, few high wispy clouds. Nice day. From Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, great to be here. Uh, it's 36, so a little cold here, but we still also have lovely sun. And from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Also clear and sunny here and uh, 29 Fahrenheit minus 2C, a uh, little breezy. If you like what we do here on TWIV, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Very, very sorry to tell you all that a uh, colleague of ours has passed away, structural virologist Mavis Agbanje McKenna. She was, of course, at the University of Florida in uh, Gainesville, and we... We're really fortunate to have Mavis on TWIV 448, which uh, took place in Madison, Wisconsin. And we were, this was pre Brienne, I think, and we were all there. I, I was actually in the audience. You were. were you? I was. <laughs> had you joined TWIV yet at that time? I had not. Oh, okay. Did you like the show? I did like the show. And in fact, uh, as a result, I emailed some questions to Mavis, and she was incredibly kind in answering them. She was an awesome guest. Yeah. You know, I, that's, that's, I would echo that too. I mean, I, I didn't know who she was before I met her. And she was so impressive as a person and so warm and giving that I wish I had been her student. Basically. And, and her, her, work, her work was awesome. So, very, I, I mean, she's gone now, but I, I recommend listeners go back to Twiv 448 if you didn't catch that. Yeah. It was a, a great yeah, live show yeah, with her. Yeah, I would agree. Probably uh, the longest uh, interview you will find with her, I would guess, right? Well, it might be. We were there for an hour and a half, and, and she told us about her, her life, her career, and, and all that. It was really good, really excellent. So and, Mavis was a uh, colleague of mine Yep. when, we right. were at, uh, when I was at UF. Lucky you. Uh, yes, quite so. I served on a, a couple of um, her PhD students' thesis committees. Uh, and a couple of other committees. And uh, she was also, some of my work was, had an interest in um, some s structural stuff about pox viruses. And she was my go-to person for anything structural. And Mavis was uh, one of a kind. I wow. told her once, Mavis, you're the real deal. <laughs> there you go. Uh, you know, there was uh, never any BS from Mavis. It was always <laughs> the straight stuff. Um, and she never complained. Uh, you know, sure, she would grouse now and then, but it was always with a chuckle <laughs> and a laugh, okay? Uh, just an extraordinarily uh, good-natured, straightforward, reliable, trustworthy, caring uh, person, just really uh, one of a kind. And for those, who, um, for those who don't know, I think it's worth just very briefly, she was born in Nigeria, and she has, when she gives these bio talks, she has this delightful slide of her with a bunch of her childhood friends in the village where she was growing up in Nigeria. Uh, and uh, I don't remember the whole story, but her, her parents had emigrated to the UK, and I believe she was uh, being raised by her uh, grandmother. Uh, but the Nigerian Civil War uh, necessitated um, her... Uh, emigrating to join her parents at the age of 11 uh, to the UK where she got her PhD and ultimately did a postdoc with um, Michael Rossman at Purdue and ultimately came to uh, University of Florida in 1999. And so I knew her, I uh, knew her there for like 16 years. And it was in 2013 that she was diagnosed with uh, ALS, amyotropic lateral sclerosis, 
And so actually, as that disease goes, she had a pretty long course because that the average uh, time on that is about uh, two years. And she got seven and a half years out of it. But it's, it's a devastating disease that's a slowly debilitating neurotropic disease. And once again, uh, you know, if it weren't for the fact that like in that TWIV, if people uh, saw it, if it weren't for the fact that she was in a wheelchair, you would never know that there was anything wrong because she was just 100 percent there all the time. OK. And uh, and my understanding is uh, up until the very end, every everywhere she could be, she was there and uh, the disease was not present. It was just Mavis. And uh, so she's an extraordinary individual hmm. and we're going to miss her. Yeah. Her uh, her mentor, Michael Rossman, passed away not too long ago. Not too long Two, ago. Two uh, big losses in structural virology there. And also in people, of course. All right. After uh, two uh, TWIVs where we kind of wandered away from uh, SARS-CoV-2, not completely, but kind of, someone wrote about last Friday's episode and said, wow, now I know what it was like pre <laughs> COVID-19. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, we were pretty deep in the weeds. <laughs> but he, but the writer said, you know, after listening for a year, I kind of got it, not all of it, but some of it. So that's good. And I said, you know, just listen. Stick around. Listen, stick around. It's fun. Uh, we have three kind of short papers for you today. I think Boy, you'll I think. like them. I think you'll like them all. They're all relevant. <sighs> when is when is something we do here on TWIF not it's relevant? It's always relevant. <laughs> And so the first one comes from Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, publication of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, of course. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, weekly. If you don't subscribe to it, you should. It's free. It covers all kinds of uh, outbreaks. not just Very in, readable. Not just yes. infectious diseases. <laughs> you know, if there's a, some toxicity going on, they, they try and track it down and so forth. Smoking, traffic accidents. And, and it's sort of the classic. It's the place where you can read about, you know, the first description of a lot of uh, infectious diseases in the past. Yep. First description of an, an, an immunodeficiency syndrome in five men in Los Angeles in 1981. First yeah. report of AIDS. Yeah. Okay. So this one is called Maximizing Fit for Cloth and Medical Procedure Masks to Improve Performance and Reduce SARS-CoV-2 Transmission and Exposure 2021. You know, we've talked a lot about masking, but I don't know if we've ever really gone over data. So we're going to, we have some data in this paper. Uh, so just as a background, you know, 38 states, well, as of February 1, 38 states in D.C. had masking mandates. I guess that number has gone down now to 36. <laughs> I can then. testify to that. Yeah. Hey, hey, Rich, I, I wanted to, to say, ask, sorry about that, Rich. Rich, I wanted to <laughs> ask you. Now, the governor in Texas said, you know, don't don't wear masks. But what are people doing? Are some people still wearing them? Uh, I don't know. I haven't been out. Uh, <laughs> I I know. I know a That's little. That's an even bit. better solution. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> so, and I actually, literally, because this was what three or four days ago that the last. Uh, actually, I'm not even sure that that takes effect for a little while. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but I'm I'm not entirely uh, clear on that. Uh, but what the governor said was that there was no longer a. This is interesting. He said there's no longer a mask mandate, mm -hmm. uh, and accompanying that, there's no longer lifted restrictions on restaurants. Restaurants can, uh, I believe, uh, operate at 100 percent capacity, indoor dining, et cetera. Which, by the way, uh, they just did in Massachusetts as well, and right. I think is a very stupid move. And uh, But accompanying this, he said, uh, basically, um, uh, w the government should not have to tell you what to do. We've been through this drill. You know what the pandemic is. We recommend still that you wear masks, okay? And we expect people to behave appropriately, okay? So it'll be very interesting to see what happens with that. I do know that a number of... Um, now, I also don't think that, um, I, uh, I forget how this was done, but I don't think, and I can look it up while we're talking, I don't think the local governments can overrule this and impose their own mandates, but individual businesses can do whatever they want. Yes. Now, this is a good <laughs> or a bad thing, depending on your perspective, because unfortunately, <laughs> without a mandate, it means the individual businesses are stuck with imposing 
the mask mandate themselves and putting up with all of the um, uh, foolishness that goes along with that. Though, you know, in a lot of uh, in a lot of environments, I think what they can just say is, if you're not wearing a mask, we're not going to serve you. Period. Yeah. All right. And quite a few businesses, at least uh, around me, and I believe from reading a paper elsewhere in the state, uh, are going to maintain a mask requirement. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is a real test of this notion of individual responsibility, okay? This is the, uh, you know, one of the rationales for not having a mask, mask mandate to start with is don't tell us what to do. And I think even the governor has said, uh, we know what the recommendations are at this point. I don't think anybody's arguing that a mask isn't a good idea anymore, at least officially. Okay, so uh, even here in Texas, where individual rights are an extremely big deal, uh, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. You know, maybe people will actually behave themselves. Yeah, well, that's why I asked right you. Right here, yeah. I would encourage them to do so. Yeah. Okay. All right, no, and we'll I, see what know, happens. Rich, you know that as soon as spring break occurs, there is a certain age group of people that will absolutely laugh at this. And they'll be at Padre Island, and they'll be behaving as they do. Well, we will see. Maybe. It's even on your license plate. It says, don't mess with Texas, okay? <laughs> uh, there's a, um, I mean, to Rich's, to Rich's point about individual choice and the ethics of that, this is kind of an interesting, you know, an especially interesting ethical situation because the data that we have on ordinary cloth masks, which is what we're talking about here, um, suggests that these are most effective at keeping droplets from infected people going on to uninfected people. They're not so useful for protecting the uninfected people from inhaling the virus, um, although they may have some effect there. But they, the, the epidemiological data are, are suggesting that wearing a mask is something that you do primarily to protect other people. Um, given that that's the case, this seems like a textbook case of a situation where the state should be stepping in and saying, we're mandating this. Right. Because right? that's the kind of thing where... Yeah, it's your personal choice, but it affects other people. So what's going on in Massachusetts? Then it's different than Texas. We have, uh, we have, so the, I, I think the restaurant reopening is, I shouldn't say stupid, premature. <clears throat> um, you call it Neanderthal. <laughs> right, right. No, it's not quite Neanderthal. It's just they're, they're getting immense pressure from businesses to, you know. Oh, of course they are. Of possible. course they are. But, you know. Um, and, and our case counts are coming down, but they've kind of leveled a little. Hey, and they're, not, yeah. they're not where they were back in August. Um, you know, which was much lower. So, so we're still dealing with that. And, but we do have, uh, masks are still mandated statewide in all public places, which oh, is okay. actually a little too extreme for my liking. I can't go out and <laughs> walk outside without a mask on, without violating the mm -hmm. law, which is, mm -hmm. seems a little silly. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, most places it's indoor public places, but so we've got we've got the hundred percent mask mandate, but then we've got let's throw open the doors of the restaurants. So all right, so this is all about how to get your masks to work better. So the, the idea here is that if you're wearing a cloth mask or these these medical procedure masks, you know the surgical masks, they don't fit as well as say an N95, and so they decided to uh, do a study to see if they could improve this. And they used, uh, uh, they did an experiment where they have um, a pliable elastomeric head form, a.k.a. a dummy, <laughs> a plastic <laughs> dummy, <laughs> to simulate a person No one ever coughing. called me that. <laughs> uh, to simulate a person coughing uh, by producing aerosols from a mouthpiece. And, and they're using potassium chloride particles from 0.1 to 7 microns. Uh, in size, uh, and and uh, they're they're asking they're actually, they can measure these, and then they they look at different masking configurations. And if you're wondering about the size here, so I look this up. Um, large droplets greater than five microns they fall to the to the ground at about three to five feet. These are typically the ones that we think uh, harbor SARS-CoV-2. Uh, these are the ones that lodge in your upper tract. The big ones. You know, 60 to 100 microns, they f when you sneeze or cough, those fall to the ground pretty quickly, two to three feet. And then the ones less than five microns can go long distances, and they can actually go down into your lower tract. But here, 
the range. They've got the range that covers these uh, five microns. So uh, they say that this is simulating quiet breathing during moderate work. Yes, yes. We're, we're so not, I, are we supposed to be, is this the idea that we're just, this is breathing? Is this, you know, you worked out a little, you're coughing? <laughs> it's sort yeah, of hard for me breathing. to understand what that means. They're breathing because you do emit plenty of aerosols while you breathe as well as coughing or sneezing, but they didn't look at that. But this would be breathing yeah. through your mouth. This would be breathing through your mouth, yeah. And do you remember, yeah, I don't this know. Is, and I, I would like to comment, this is an improvement over a lot of these other, uh, like the laser light show studies that we've talked about, where they have somebody shouting something like, stay healthy into a, you know, a laser yeah. box. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Of course, tons of spray goes out. So this is a much more, a much more realistic type of, you're just sitting around, you got your mask on, what are you stopping? Now, I, I went back and looked at our episode on Gesundheit 2. Yes. <laughs> Anybody remember that? Um, oh, yeah. That's a machine you put your face into and just, and they had students with confirmed influenza on a campus recite the alphabet, you know, talk right. for a while. And then they wiped it out and see, saw how much virus was in there. And from that, they concluded that speaking was all you needed to exhale influenza virus. You didn't have to cough or sneeze or anything. And of course, that would be harder to do with this virus, which requires a BSL-3. So anyway, um, they have these head forms and they're measuring receiving particles and giving particles, a source and a receiver. And they do, uh, um, they set, they, you know, there's a ventilation rate and they have 10 different masking configurations and they do it for each one, three 15 minute runs. And that's the experiment. Okay, and there's a nice graph. And by the way, the, the modifications are you can put, you can take a one of those medical procedure masks and just make the knot in the sides. And that tends to p uh, fill in the gaps, right, and pull it closer to your face. Because if you know, these, these, these disposable ones, they tend to have gaps, and that's part of the problem. Uh, so that's one thing. And the other is to put a cloth mask on top of it, give you that double uh, layer, which will, in, in theory, compensate. So the graph says it all, man. It's really – so they have, you know, cumulative mass exposure, micrograms of particles versus these different combinations. They have no mask on the uh, the uh, receiver or the donor, <laughs> right? Uh, they have a mask on one and not on the other or vice versa or a mask on both, right? And you can see if you put a mask on both, it really helps a lot. Uh, we can give you some numbers here. Uh, the unknotted ma medical mask blocks 56% of the particles from a simulated cough. The cloth mask alone blocks 51% of particles. Cloth and medical mask, 85% of the particles are blocked. And if you knot the mask, 77%. So if, if you don't do anything knotting the sides and you're, if you're wearing a medical mask, that can help. Anyway, as far as these simulations would you know, indicate what's happening with virus-laden droplets. Of course, we don't know that. Um, and then uh, they, they looked at receiving end. Um, if you uh, add a cloth mask over the source, 82% reduction. Um, when the source is unmasked and the receiver has a double mask, you have 83%. When the source and receiver have double masks or knotted and tucked masks, you reduce uh, 95 to 96%. The knotted and tucked actually looks like a really good deal because there's no additional requirement. Yeah. And you just, you know, you just tie the sides. And they've got a nice picture showing how to do it. Now, I don't wear those. I wear cloth masks. Uh, mine are double layered. But uh, I could add, you know, New York City now is recommending this double layer business. And this is partly why, because the CDC has issued these. These experiments were done back in January. Um, so that's the story, and that's why – so if you're wondering why CDC – I mean, I was skeptical. I said, why are they saying two masks? Yeah, in theory, they would be better, but here are the, here are the numbers. For potassium chloride particles, two masks or tying your mask is good. So if you want to avoid spreading potassium chloride particles in the laboratory, <laughs> this is exactly what you should do. <clears throat> right. Uh, I, I mean, there's no – it, one of the ongoing issues with the whole discussion around masks has been the difficulty of getting real epidemiological data because they're never implemented in isolation, right? So you, in fact, there's just recently, there's another MMWR uh, paper that just came out today that looked at states and counties with and without mask mandates 
um, and with and without, I think, restaurant closures were the things that they looked at. And they found that places with mask mandates and restaurant closures had much lower case counts and lower death rates and then other places that didn't have those. Uh, but what exactly caused that? Was it the masks? Was it the restaurant closures? Was it that those states are generally more stringent about all of these uh, uh, these sorts of measures? Um, so it's, it's a combination of things. I just shared this graph. Can you guys see it? I'm not sure you yeah. can. Yeah. Uh, I don't see a graph. I can, I see I can just see your something background. Something that's kind of a, a modern mm. art piece. Oh, I'm that's, sorry. Uh, that's is this from Artological? Yeah, that's my oh. that's my um, <laughs> it's my desktop on my machine. Let me try oh. and do something mm -hmm. else. Uh, desktop. <laughs> Here, let's try this one. Sorry. Uh, do you see? There the, we go. Yes. Uh -huh. See the graph now. Perfecto. Yep. Perfecto. Yep. So that's you it. The, you have the mass exposure on the X, and then the Y are the different. Uh, and then, uh, you know, unknotted mask, double mask, knotted tucked medical procedure mask, and, and the different, no mask, you know, mask on one or the other, and then two masks. So you can see if you have masks on both people, that does really well. So, right. Anyway, I will continue to wear my mask. And um, it's a cloth mask. Um, I could put a, I do have surgical masks. I could put them underneath. Wouldn't be an issue with me. I, uh... So I don't have much uh, uh, exposure. I don't, like I said, I don't get out much. I am <laughs> anticipating weeks from now taking a trip. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know, you know, this is end of April. So who knows what the situation will be uh, then. But anticipating this, I can imagine doing something like traveling on an airplane or something, going the whole hog, yeah. double mask, yeah. you know. Um. I've just confirmed that the uh, change in uh, restrictions in uh, Texas takes effect March 10th. So that's another five days from now that all businesses are open 100%. The mask thing is limited. Individual businesses can limit capacity or impose mask restrictions at their own uh, discretion. And I believe and federal property, you have to wear a mask because that's the federal. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much federal property there is. In so Texas, I'll be lot. Very, I'll there's be, a lot of federal uh, property. I'll be very interested to see, as I said before, uh, what's uh, how people react to this, uh, and I'll be interested to see what happens with the uh, caseload. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because we're bottomed out. Interestingly, you know, people say, "Oh, it's plummeted. We're bottomed out." But you know, we're at a level that is at the peak of the second wave. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there's still yeah. a lot of disease out there. Yeah. Um, and any, uh, any, at any rate, if in particular relative to states where they've uh, continued restrictions, if the caseload uh, continues to rise here, we're uh, we're doing the experiment. Okay. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Uh, and I hope. Well, I hope for the best. All right. Another our second uh, little brevia here is a, is a. Uh preprint from Med Archive, so not yet peer-reviewed, but I think nonetheless interesting. It's called SARS-CoV-2 Total and Subgenomic RNA Viral Load in Hospitalized Patients. And this comes from uh, Adam Loring's group at the University of Michigan. And ve some very interesting tidbits that we can take away from this, you know, on top of the message. And so, as uh, everyone knows, uh, we're using... Uh, reverse transcriptase PCR to detect infection. And here's a, here's a number for you. These assays have a limit of detection of between 5 and 500 copies of viral RNA per reaction. There's a number you want to tuck into the back of your head, okay? <laughs> That's pretty sensitive, right? Five copies of RNA. Um, but here, the, the whole shtick in this paper is something we've talked about before. What's the relationship between getting a positive PCR test or any nucleic acid amplification test, LAMP, for example? What's the relationship between a positive test and infectivity, especially when you're later in the course of an infection? And so here is a number for another number for you. While the median duration of detection of viral RNA in the upper tract is about 14 and a half days from symptom onset. In many cases, you can 
find RNA for weeks. And they say long past when people are infectious. And that is the problem. Well, could we do something to say you're infectious or you're not? And, and because of this issue, the, the, and I didn't realize this, the CDC no longer recommends a test-based strategy for discontinuing isolation precautions. The current guidelines, they say patients with mild to moderate disease, you have to be isolated from 10 days from symptom onset. Because we, we think for the most part, after that time, you're not shedding infectious virus. And people with a more severe disease or immunocompromised patients, uh, they have to be isolated for 10 to 20 days because they, they tend to shed virus longer. Uh, and th how do we know this? Well, the, people have studied viral infectivity, and that's hard to do. You have to isolate virus in a BSL-3 and measure it and so forth. Um, so that's that. But they, they do note that immunocompromised patients can shed infectious virus for many weeks without having symptoms, right? And we did a paper from uh, Loring Group a while ago about one of the first patients, long-term infection, where they have met multiple bouts of shedding. So um, this idea of using symptom-based uh, strategy for, for determining isolation, they say, is kind of problematic. Okay, so we don't have a test, a, a high-throughput test that could say you're infectious or not. Boy, that would be great if we did, because viral yeah. culture is not high-throughput, right? Oh. And what's the alternative? Well, one possibility is subgenomic mRNAs. This in virus-infected cells, there are subgenomic mRNAs shorter than the full genome. In the virus particle, there's just the full genome. But in an infected cell, you have shorter mRNAs for all of the viral proteins. And in theory, that should be indicative of infection, right? However, it's not necessarily because we did a paper a while ago, actually, where they showed that mRNAs could actually be protected by membranes in a cell and last a long time after the infection is over. So there's some issues with that, but they wanted to revisit it here and they did so in a very nice uh, quantitative way. Um, and by the way, two more pieces of information that you should know. Um, they say they quote a previous study of nine patients and, and they found no subgenomic RNA could be found in the throat for up to five days post symptom onset. And a larger study of 35 patients, no infectious virus, no subgenomic RNA after eight days from symptom onset. That's in mild disease, even though the RNA sticks around uh, for weeks. All right. So here in this paper, here's the bottom line. If you want to go get a cup of coffee, <laughs> <laughs> subgenomic transcripts these short guys that are only in infected cells, they become undetectable before the total RNA uh, when evaluated in relation to how long symptoms go. And they say, it doesn't really matter because the total RNA really gives us the picture already. And so it's not going to really help us to measure subgenomic right. MRNA. And, the, and the, subgenomic, the subgenomic falls off faster, but it it falls off at a fixed difference from the total RNA. That's so right. when they when you look at the graphs in this paper, which is open access, because of course, because it's a preprint, you see that you could just extrapolate from the total, the full length RNA and say, oh, well, the subgenomic should be at this level, right. which means you don't really get any new information from That's the subgenomic. Right. It's, it's too bad. So I, Go ahead. I, I want to elaborate on... Uh, just a couple of things, or get some elaboration on a couple of things. One of these you may have already mentioned, and I was traveling. Um, <laughs> so the idea about subgenomic RNA, well, first of all, subgenomic RNA is more than just a little piece of RNA, okay? It's, as we've discussed before, subgenomic, these are messenger RNAs that are formed in a fashion that uh, splices a common leader sequence from the five prime end of the genome. Uh, to the body of the message, which is, uh, depending on the message, but even in the uh, lightest case, quite some distance away. So these are uh, very specifically uh, crafted uh, during the virus uh, infection. And, th and they're specifically amplified using primers that can detect the linkage of this 
um, leader sequence to the body of the message. Okay. So it's not like this is going to pick up any little piece of RNA. It's a very specific thing. Now, am I correct? The, the assumption is that the presence of a subgenomic RNA would, uh, the assumption is that that would be more indicative of an active infection. Is that the idea here? That's the idea. Yes. Yeah. But as we have already seen in a paper we did a while ago, the subgenomics can be protected for a long time after the infection's over. They stick around. Right. Right. That was right. kind That's of a, and, where I was going with that, and, and they said, you know, you can't really, uh, you can't really go by subgenomics alone. It's a good idea, but it doesn't work. All right, so this pa- this study, they have nasopharyngeal swabs from 190 patients that were, who were admitted to the University of Michigan Hospital last March to June last year, 2020, and for most of them, they had uh, clinical information, which is good. You want to know what kind of uh, infection it was. And for these individuals, the median days from symptom onset to testing was five days. So these people felt something, but it took them five days to go and get a test and have the test done. You know, if you don't feel badly, you're not going to go right away, I suppose. And then they analyzed all these data that they have. And here, here's the result. No difference in the rate of decline of the transcripts when compared to symptom duration, all the slopes are equal. Now, you know, when you, when you have a line, you have a slope and you also have an x-intercept, right? The When you compare, say, total N signal. So let's take one mRNA, N, the nucleocapsid mRNA, uh, compared to uh, the, the total N that you measure with a different set of primers, right? Because you have total N, which would measure all N-containing RNAs, including the genome and then nmRNA. If you compare total N to the subgenomic N, you get very different X intercepts. Same thing with E and subgenomic E. And so there's there's less there's significantly less of these subgenomic right. transcripts than there is of full length, which is what you would expect. And the the different X intercepts reflect differences in days until RNA is no longer detectable uh, uh, when they do forty PCR cycles. Okay. So then they they further looked at these data statistically. Median duration from symptom onset to a negative subgenomic N RT-PCR, 25 days, for subgenomic E, 14 days. Okay, so differences. All 185 patients were positive for total RNA regardless of symptom duration. By 15 days and more, from symptom onset, only 14% of the patients were positive for the subgenomic E compared to 35% for subgenomic N. So as we get away from symptoms, the, as Alan said, the subgenomic is going down much quicker. Okay, now here's another good number to remember. <clears throat> this is very good. The total copy number threshold that correlates with a loss of culture infectivity, this is from other studies, is somewhere between 5.5 and 6.5 and log 10 copies per mil. Right, you guys know what a log is, right? 5.5 or 6.5 logs per mil. So that, that's, a, that's a good number to know, and you can always get that from the, the cycle threshold. So they determined so, uh, that— let's, let's do that for the listeners, however, who yeah. don't necessarily <laughs> think in logs. We're it's talking, a dead tree. It's a dead tree. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the midpoint in that assessment is about a million copies per mil, right? Mm-hmm. Ten to the sixth. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, about a million so, copies and, per and, mil. And remind people that the sensitivity of the assays we were talking down here was five copies to a hundred copies per assay. Yeah. Okay. So so to once again to reemphasize that the PCR assays for RNA can be uh, uh, incredibly more sensitive than uh, would be necessary to determine infectivity. Right. Okay. Yeah, and the way you get that from a CT is by using a sample of known RNA concentration mm-hmm. and making a sort of standard curve right. and then uh, being able to correlate that to your, not correlate, but compare to your CT. All right, and so in fact, that's what they did. They determined copy numbers in their samples using standard curves, Right where you spike in or you add in known amounts of RNA, 
uh, and they did that for total N, total E, subgenomic E, and subgenomic N. Now, if you're wondering, what is this total versus subgenomic? You can, the subgenomic is, is going to be just the messenger RNA, and total, say, N is going to be larger pieces, breakage products of the genome, the whole genome itself. It's going to be on top of subgenomic. Not necessarily the splice stuff. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. You make your primers specific for the message, yeah. Right. All right, so if you, with at about a million total E copies, 47% of samples were negative for subgenomic E. All right, so let's do that again. Total E, a million copies of total E, half of the samples are negative for subgenomic E. At total N of a million, 24% are negative for subgenomic N. And no samples are negative for subgenomic RNA at a copy number greater than, than 6 million, say, copies per mil. So there's, it's it's not zero. That's that's the key here. Finally, um, how does this relate to the total genome? So they looked at the CT values of these samples, which they had in the data. They could not detect subgenomic E past 32 cycles, and they couldn't detect subgenomic N past 35 cycles. It's negative, and you can have total RNA more positive past those cycles, right? So, you know, this, on face value, it suggests mm, maybe these would be good to measure. Um, okay, and finally, um, clinical samples, total N is found at a 16-fold higher level than subgenomic N, and E is 137-fold higher than subgenomic E when they look at all the clinical samples. And this is unchanged throughout the infection, you know, in the course of infection that they have. So there's a lot more whole genome and other pieces with E in it than there is actual subgenomic. Right. That's e right. And they conclude. It's been crafted, as, as Rich said. Subgenomic RNA contributes very little to the overall signal of total transcripts. Uh, instead of if you you know can't measure subgenomic RNA, you can take these numbers and calculate the yes. amount of subgenomic RNA from the total because you know this uh, full difference between them. Right. All right. The last the last bit of data is they took uh, this persistently infected patient who, whose clinical description we did some time ago. Uh, that that individual. Apparently, it was infected for 119 days. This is an immunosuppressed patient. And they found continued expression of both total and subgenomic transcripts throughout this time. And the difference of N to subgenomic was 11-fold, E to subgenomic 84-fold, similar to what we just found for the other patients. But that was over the whole course of infection. And that's an important point. So their, their argument is, we don't get any much much more additional information from subgenomic RNA. Um, the the total RNA is enough to tell us at a certain copy number we're no longer likely to be infectious, and so we we don't need to do this. Yeah, because you can just take your total RNA copy number, divide by a hundred, and you've got the amount of subgenomic E you would have gotten. Yeah, out of that right now, let, let's make the assumption that if when subgenomic E disappears, you're no longer infectious. All right. And they say, this is problematic. Why is it problematic? Well, in their study, the median number of days from symptom onset to negative RT-PCR is 25 days. That means you'd actually <laughs> have to quarantine people longer than you would if you just looked at total RNA, right? So it's not a good idea. And we know they're not infectious for that long. So the sub presence of subgenomic RNA uh, is not telling us uh, whether they're infectious or not. So it's, it's this, the RNAs are there. The subgenomic RNAs are there beyond when they're no longer infectious. So do you know uh, how the, let's say the CDC, came up with the recommendation 
that you uh, no longer have to stay isolated uh, after 10 days after symptom onset. Okay. Because the, the sort of yeah. the, the assumption now is the 10 days after symptom onset, you're no longer uh, the probability that you're transmitting disease is right. uh, very low and you're, you're released. Did they use, is that a mashup of clinical observations and these sort of molecular observations, or is it based just on RNA copies? Do you know? No, oh, I don't think it's just based on copies. I think it's based on a correlation of copy number with infectivity. There were studies where they right. tried to isolate infectious virus from patients, right? Right. Because I'm looking yeah. at this supplementary figure one, uh, and they where they uh, look at symptom duration and... Uh, log base 10 RNA copies for N gene and E gene, mm -hmm. and they draw a line at sort of the average uh, uh, RNA load for uh, trans uh, for your being infectious. And I noticed that there is this basically after 10 days after symptom onset, although there are still people who are RNA positive, none of them have uh, uh, only a couple yeah. have yeah. copies of RNA that are in uh, that are above that cut off right, okay right so i was wondering if th those are the kind of data well yeah no uh, at any rate these data correlate very well with that uh yeah. idea of releasing people after 10 days that's that's my point and as you already said i'm sure glad that this sort of stuff is out there otherwise we would all be uh keeping people in quarantine mm -hmm. until they were clear of rna for like Almost a month. Yeah, you remember last yeah. year? That's crazy. Da Daniel Griffin used yeah. to say, "Oh, these people are PCR positive for months. We have to yeah. get them out of the hospital." <laughs> right. Yeah. Now, there's also <laughs> um, when the CDC made this recommendation, um, the the data were consistent. Were were pretty solid on two week quarantine is about right. Um, <clears throat> there, however, they they took into consideration the drop off in infectivity after. To seven, eight, nine, ten days, you're getting pretty low in the infectivity studies that, that had finally been done at that point. Uh, the other thing is there's a bit of social psychology involved. Um, if you tell somebody they have to quarantine for 20 days, they're not gonna. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> you know, and then they'll just blow it off and not quarantine at all. So at what point do you compromise down and say, okay, look, 14, well, all right, 10. And so they came up with this compromise notion that people were more likely to tolerate a 10-day quarantine and actually do it rather mm. than giving them a 14-day quarantine that they would blow off. And yeah. so, you know, that, that was kind of a, mm -hmm. and, yeah. a threshold that they were looking at in addition to the molecular data and the infectivity data. Right. So it all came together in that mm -hmm. decision. I, so also seem to, I also seem to remember that there was a time when, when they had uh, different guidelines depending on how infected or how sick you were. You know, one was if you had an asymptomatic infection, but you were PCR positive or a mild infection, I forget exactly what it was. It was 10 days, but if you were uh, hospitalized with a serious infection, then it was 14 or something like that. And and then they finally just said, okay, 10 days for everybody. And personally, I find it's a hell of a lot easier to remember. Ah, 10 days. That's right. easy. I can do that. So, Rich, the, so, uh, the recommendation of 10 days comes from studies of viral infectivity in clinical samples, and they cite three different papers here for that. Okay, good. So I have a question with regards to the uh, viral load of a patient who was newly admitted to the hospital because one set of symptoms for hospitalization might not relate to the viral infection. It might relate to the aftermath of the viral infection. Yeah, of course. So how soon... Yeah. Right, so the viral loads would be lower in those patients that were hospitalized, hospitalized right? They might be, yeah. I mean, they're all they're on their way down at that point. So they're if, measuring if you, if you viral feel loads in patients that have viral loads that are decreasing. Yes, that's it. I agree. So you you usually go to the hospital when you feel really poorly, right? You probably can't. Correct. You're, you're having trouble breathing. I think that's the yeah, trigger. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So you're quite late, and your your viral loads are probably low. I'm sure that's it's been the looked cytochrome, at. Cytochrome, yeah, exactly. Right. 
exactly. Yeah, but they, they probably do a history and try to find yes, out when yes. your actual when did you first start, start coughing? Yes. Right, and as I recall, it's uh, it's uh, correct me if I'm wrong. It's uh, ten days from either symptom onset or first PCR positive yes. test, whichever was earlier. I yep. think that's correct. Right? Yep. Because it could be that you show up PCR positive before your symptoms onset. They'll count you 10 days from there. I think that's correct. I think so. All right. So, so to summarize, um, a negative subgenomic or mRNA test likely indicates that patients are not infectious simply because a negative test correlates with low total RNA copy number. And that's why they say we're just going to go with total RNA. Okay. A copy number... Below 6 million copies per mil, that's the threshold for uh, infectivity. And they say, we found all negative subgenomic transcripts were in samples with total copy number below the threshold. And so that's why the, thresh the threshold alone for total RNA is enough, uh, it, you know, except maybe in people with long-term uh, infection. So they, they conclude, we do not believe that subgenomic RNA provides additional information not gained by total copy number. And that's why now... You get the CT value, whereas last year you didn't, right? Only Tony Fauci got his uh, right. CT value. Okay, uh, here we go. Uh, recommendations. This is from the CDC. For most adults with COVID-19 illness, for most adults, so they're already qualifying. Here, yeah. You know, uh, isolation and precautions can be discontinued 10 days after symptom onset and after resolution of fever for at least 24 hours mm -hmm. without use of blah, 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 blah. Yep. Uh, for adults who never develop symptoms, isolation and other precautions can be discontinued 10 days after the date of their first PCR positive right. test. Okay. So the, the PCR date is for if you never develop symptoms. If you develop symptoms, it's 10 days after uh, you first uh, develop symptoms. Yep. So get it's amazing CT. how all this has evolved, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yes. it's good as it should be, right? Yeah. The uh, By the way, when you have a test, usually there are two pairs of primers, so they give you a CT value for both, like an E and N primer set. So that's what the two numbers mean. They should be pretty close, but not they won't be exactly the same. And that's what you need to know. So I had a test last year. Uh, what was it, September? I don't remember. Through Columbia, CT was 37-ish. And I said, I'm not positive and and she's the lady who called me said yeah but you should still stay home you know because we didn't know at the time <laughs> and i just and here went you are staying home i stayed home and i went back <laughs> <laughs> no the thing is i went back and had it done two days later and it yeah. was completely yeah. negative yeah. so that was a false right. positive but anyway um one more and this one is quite interesting also this is a paper published in MBio, in Introduction of Two Prolines and Removal of the Polybasic Cleavage Site Lead to Higher Efficacy of a Recombinant Spike-Based SARS-CoV-2 Vaccine in the Mouse Model. Uh, this is from uh, Florian Cromer, Mount Sinai, Amanat Strohmeyer, Rathanasinghe, Schutzart, Linda Coughlin, and Adolfo Garcia Sastre. And I forgot that I handled this manuscript, so uh, <laughs> I totally forgot. I don't even know when I did this. But it has nuggets that you will all like to hear. Actually, many questions that we have had in TWIV, they're actually answered here. <laughs> so this is all about the spike, which is the focus of many vaccines, as you know. And I think everyone has no heard us discuss, you know, there are, in the SARS-CoV-2 spike, there are two cleavage sites. There's one uh, that is absolutely essential, which can be cleaved by... Temperus 2 at the cell surface or thepsin in an endosome. And then there's a second site, uh, which is cleaved by furins. And the spike mRNA vaccines, they have a prefusion confirmation, which means that you've added two prolines into the spike, uh, which uh, locks it into the confirmation before um, before the fusion occurs. And, and Jason talked a lot about that. Uh, and they say here that, you know, putting these prolines in has a beneficial effect on stability. As Jason said, you, you get more protein made, it's more stable. And so they said in this paper, well, let's look at the effect of remove, of putting these prolines in and also removing the furin site. We're going to use a mouse model and look at uh, protection. 
all right? And what they do is they have mice where they introduce ACE2 into the respiratory tract uh, with an adenovirus vector. So it's a transient production of the receptor. And then they can infect these mice uh, intranasally with their virus. So uh, it, it addresses a number of cool things. Uh, so so hang on there. Don't Don't get coffee yet. All right, so what do they do? They make, they take the original... All right, there's a couple of things here which I, which were different. They take the Wuhan, uh, I, the Wuhan strain, the only strain so far of SARS-CoV-2, the Wuhan strain, and they codon optimize it for mammalian cell expression, which I thought, why isn't it a mammalian virus to begin with? I guess you can get it better, so fine. They put a trimerization sequence on it so it makes trimers. They put another tag on so they can purify it. Um, and that, So they have a wild type construct. They have one without the uh, furin cleavage site. And then they have one with the prolines introduced. And then they have one with furin site gone and the prolines introduced. And All they're right. just they're just making spike here. They're not making whole They're virus. just making spike. Just to clear that up. And they make the spike protein in insect cells and they purify it. And, uh, you know, the, one of the first figures, and this is open access, if you want to look at a protein gel, <laughs> you can look at a protein gel. I know I know some of you love protein gels. Um, and they, they have two two things. They have I used the, to love them. They have a protein gel where they just stained with, uh, with Kumasi Blue, which I used to have all over my hands all the time. And um, it looks like all the constructs make about the same amount of 180 or so thousand Dalton protein. But then when they do a Western blot, they can see that there are smaller um, fragments made. And they say, you know, like the, the wild type has a smaller fragment. If you take away the furin cleavage site, you don't seem to get much smaller fragments. But the polyprotein has a smaller fragment, a couple of smaller fragments. I don't know what any of this means because it's a really small amount of uh, of these smaller bands, you know, because the only detected in a Western blot. But nonetheless, they get a nice amount of uh, protein production. Um, and they show that they have a monoclonal against spike. These, uh, This is recognized by this monoclonal, which binds the receptor binding domain. Okay, so now they in immunize mice with these proteins. And they, they put an adjuvant in to this, and they inject the mice intramuscularly, and they... They give them a boost. As a control, they, uh, <laughs> they immunize mice with influenza hemagglutinin made in a similar way with the adjuvant. And I, I chuckled when they called it an irrelevant immunogen because I thought, well, if you have flu, it's not irrelevant. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, it's I chuckled at the name of the adjuvant. Adivax. Um, Adivax. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny too. Uh, so I want to I want to talk about the adjuvant for yeah, a minute, yeah. and I want to, uh, in particular, quiz you guys. Maybe Brianne has something to say about this. So the adjuvant is uh, uh, squalene based. Squalene is a big long hydrocarbon. It's basically an oil, um, shark oil, and you make uh, you make an uh, an uh, if I understand it correctly, basically an emulsion. Mm -hmm. With the uh, uh, antigen in a in a liquid, uh, you know, an aqueous liquid and a squalene, and you make an emulsion. And I know from looking it up with Freund's adjuvant, which is similarly an oil-based adjuvant, you make that right. emulsion, and it has the effect of, uh, to at least some extent, denaturing the antigen. So that uh, if you look at what comes out the other end in the immune response, you expose. Uh, in that case, both conformational epitopes and epitopes that are more linear epitopes that would otherwise be buried in a 3D conformation. With this squalene-based adjuvant, would we expect the same sort of thing to happen, to have at least some denaturing activity, depending on the antigen, or do we not know? Um, I do not know. Um, what I know about the adjuvants uh, that are sort of these oil emulsion adjuvants is that a big part of what they do is protect the antigen from degradation um, and sort of lead to like a local depot of antigen um, that's not getting degraded as well and is going to persist a bit longer uh, in terms of making an immune response. Um, there are other adjuvants that actually will 
stimulate innate immune responses. Um, but that is, this is not one of those. This is one that's really working by sort of more physical effects on stabilizing the antigen and protecting it from degradation. Yep, that's right. And this uh, I'm is, keeping uh, this in mind as I look at how they evaluate these because uh, to me, there's a, there may be a difference in uh, uh, immunoreactivity as measured by an ELISA uh, and immunoreactivity as based by a neutralization test, depending on whether you're making antibody to conformational epitopes or to linear epitopes. Am I Absolutely. thinking straight? Okay, you are. Good. All right. So I just wanted to keep, I wanted to raise that issue and keep it in mind as we're looking at the All data. right. Let's keep it in mind. Full and credit on my immunology exam. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is, uh, <laughs> this, this is MF59 is used in influenza vaccines in Europe, I believe, but not in the U.S. Um, all right. So then they uh, prime and they boost these mice. They measure, they bleed them and they say, are there antibodies that bind these various proteins, all the animals made an anti-receptor binding domain response. It was higher in the proteins lacking the furin and f lacking the furin plus PP than in the wild type or PP alone. PP are the two prolines, okay? And delta CS is the furin deletion. So delta CS, delta CS, PP, higher titers of anti-RBD than in the wild type or PP and then uh, they also looked in cells, uh, in vero, infected vero cells, um, similar patterns. And then they did a micro-neutralization assay with virus. Uh, here, wild-type PP and delta-CS had similar levels of neutralization. Delta-CS PP had higher serum neutralization titers. And how much higher? Well, you know... It, 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 you look at the graph. These are scatter plots. Each dot or fig or triangle or square is an individual mouse, right? And so you get a range of you get some mice that make very low neutralizing response, but for the most part, you know the the average or the mean is higher in delta CSPP. How much higher? Um, heart, it's not that much, right? It's a log scale. Yeah. And it looks like about. Uh, maybe a fourfold, fourfold effect or something like uh, that. Yeah, I was going to say fourfold. Vincent, what is the strain of mouse they used? Mickey. <laughs> Stop it. There's hundreds of them. Balb C. Balb uh, C. Okay. Why do you males ask Dixon? Females. Why do you ask Males Dixon? or females? Well, because it depends on the age and the sex of the animal yeah. and the strain of the animal as to what kind of an immune response you're going to get back, uh, depending on the kind of antigen and the adjuvants that you use. I've had a lot of experience at this level. And I can tell you that uh, if you lined up all of the strains of mice that you can get from, let's say, Jackson Laboratories up in Maine, and you gave them the same amount of antigen in the same way, in the same place, you'd get... 150 different kinds of responses from those. And yeah. so this applies just to this strain of mouse. And of course. This, are of course. they males or females? All females. Females. All females. All females. That's interesting because I used the old yeah. males. So these are these are six to eight week old female balbs, um, which are pretty commonly used for a lot of vaccine studies, at least by females. purified protein vaccines. Um, that's a great question. You, you um, thank really, you. Do I get A plus on your exam? <laughs> you do. You do. I, I, my only answer is because when I was doing those experiments, that's what my um, mentor told me to use. Wow. Um, I don't have an answer of why. And when I well, made the decisions myself, it wasn't always all females. You know, well, and, and, hormonal cycles in a female animal are different than in a male animal, obviously. And, and, and for, for parasitic disease work, males were the, uh, the animal of choice because of their... Um, flat line behavior in terms of their hormonal levels, whereas females were all over the place. So, so that's uh, it, it, the NIH would prefer you to use an equal mix unless you have evidence that sex does right. not matter. You are so right. So on your uh, on your grant application, or the, in our fact, in our animal protocols, we have to say uh, you're using fifty yeah. fifty, or if not, mm -hmm. do you have evidence that it doesn't matter? All right. Right. So I don't know. It does matter. I, I had evidence that it yeah, did yeah, matter, sure. in fact. Now, for certain <laughs> things, it will, I'm sure. But for other things, it, it does not matter. No, that's right. That's right. Uh, all right. So there, there is um, – now, now let's, add, let's discuss this in the context of Rich's point. Does any of this 
make sense in the context of denaturation by adjuvant, Rich? Well, I was looking at that. Let me go back to that figure. Um, what I, eh, not. Not really. Not really? No. Okay, because uh, if I'm looking at the figure, what is it, figure two? Uh, if uh, if I understand it, uh, these uh, prime boost reactivity to RBD, yeah, uh, you know that's a that's a pretty limited uh, epitope. It is okay. That's yeah. almost linear to start with, so I wouldn't expect that to. What I'd be looking for is a difference between say neutralizing activity in F and cell based uh, infected cell based ELISA uh, in E and and I don't see a whole lot of difference. So maybe it doesn't make much difference. Okay. Which is good news. That's yeah, fine. Yeah, it's good. All right. The last thing they do is a little bit of um, lung immunohistochemistry. They harvest lungs and they do staining for, they use antibodies to look for the viral nuclear protein. They can find it in all of the groups on day two and four, but the Delta CSPP had very few positive cells. All right, so that's the one that was most um, – actually, did I, did I mention uh, weight loss? No, I didn't mention it because that's coming up, I guess. Where did we uh, – I don't know if they, they mentioned in the text, but if you look at weight loss, uh, it, it, nobody died in this experiment. No mouse died. Uh, this is not a lethal infection uh, in mice. And everyone loses weight. You know, you go down to – Mm, 85 to 95 percent within six days, then you recover. Uh, but the and except for the Delta CSPP immunized mice, they go down to 95 in two days and then recover very quickly. So they're very well protected. They seem to be better protected than um, the mice immunized with the others, with the other um, proteins. So the, and they also have fewer NP positive cells in the lung. So then they stain them to look for pathology, infiltration of uh, cells coming into the lung. And they were scored by a qualified veterinary pathologist, <laughs> which you want, right? Because these are mice. Um, two days, all mice have histopathology typical of interstitial pneumonia and alveolar inflammation. In the wild type group, the congestion and edema were more pronounced in S vaccinated groups than in groups vaccinated with HA protein. Isn't that interesting? And the, the uh, overall pathology was lowest for CSPP followed by PP, followed by CS, followed by wild type. So that's interesting that the immunized mice have more pathology than unimmunized mice. And um, they, they think, well, that's probably a result of uh, infiltration of immune cells into the lung, right, which is going to score as uh, pathology. So that's the study. Uh, so what's going on here? They think that uh, removal of the furin site helps. Maybe it makes it more stable. Um, and now here's the cool part. Chadox vaccine, AstraZeneca, CanSino and Gamaleya vectored candidates use wild type spike. We didn't know that actually. We knew Chadox, but I think we, we didn't know about CanSino. And I didn't know Gamaleya. about the others, and I really appreciated this part of the discussion to summarize yeah. these. And of course, the inactivated vaccines by Sinovac and Sinopharm, they're all wild type as well because they're made by, by growing uh, infectious virus. Now, Moderna and Pfizer, of course, have the PP changes, but they have the cleavage, the furin cleavage site. Uh, and so, but they do damn well, right? So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm not You're worried about right. that. <laughs> then they come to J and J, which whose results we discussed last week, and which they didn't have when they wrote this paper. Um, J and J has the Delta CSPP, right? Um, and that did really well. 100% protection against hospitalization and death, even in South Africa. And then they, they mentioned the Novavax, uh, which is in phase three. They're using the spike protein, which they make in insect cells with Delta CSPP. I did not know that. That I did not. And it's adjuvanted. So 
Tuesday, we're going to have Matt Freeman on, who's been collaborating with Novavax. So we can ask him all about that. That'll be fun. But I didn't know that Novavax protein had uh, Delta CSPP in its adjuvant that I knew that part. So that's good to know. So now, this raises the possibility of mixing vaccines to get a better response than just one of them, right? Is that like mixing, I mean, you, uh, mixing drink sticks in? A little bit, a little bit, like a zombie. You're going to make a zombie. But uh, Brienne answered that question about three or four episodes ago, in that you could almost expect a, a, no damage from using mixed vaccine, first of all. And you might even get a better response if you use two different vaccines for the same purpose. So this is an interesting the final sentence. While our goal was not vaccine development, <laughs> we want studied the effect of stabilizing elements on the immunogenicity. Sanofi Pasteur has announced development of a recombinant protein-based vaccine, and several additional protein candidates are being developed with Novavax's candidate expected to be licensed authorized. Our, our data show this approach might be effective. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> uh, yeah, Novavax is in phase three, and they should be. Novavax along. actually didn't they report their phase three already? Part, it was a. Yeah, they did, didn't they? They reported at the same time J and J reported yeah. theirs, but for some reason they seem to be further behind in the That's EUA right. process. That's right. So we should find we should find them in front of the FDA soon, right? Yeah, I would expect so. So we'll, we'll ask Matt, what's going on, Matt? And he'll say, I'm, I am unable yeah. to tell you. I'm, I'm under contract. My, my attorney has <laughs> told me not to discuss this at this time. Anyway. Novavax, uh, this is from their website, press release. Uh, vaccine demonstrates 89.3% yep. uh, efficacy in UK phase three trial. Yeah. You okay. know, where, you know, <laughs> this is uh, just amazing. It I, is. I, Truly. I, I, can, I don't want to. I don't want to use the word luck, okay? Because there is so much heavy right. duty research and dedication yeah, right. right. involved and that kind of stuff. But this is not HIV. No. Okay. This is a. This is a an easier target than HIV. So from a from a natural biological point of view, there was a certain amount of luck, if you want to call it that, or well. fortune. Good fortune. Well, I think it's a big okay. part of it was the basic science that we've talked about. I mean, like what Jason was talking about with getting the right antigen and figuring out how it should be configured yeah. for this and all yeah. that that went on for the past 20 years. And this was all sitting there in literature. Right. And then when it came, you know, hey, we need this. And all the companies jumped on basically the same kind of approach on different platforms. And now we're seeing independent validation of all these approaches, first with two different mRNA vaccines that produce identical efficacy, which, I mean, that's a great validation. And then you get a, a viral vectored vaccine that's got high efficacy with the same type of antigen. And now you're, you know, you got a protein that's just the antigen and it's got high efficacy. So yeah, it's turning out that this, if you've got the right antigen, it, this is, um, this is kind of a slam dunk, I guess. It's turning out, it seems to me that, <clears throat> uh, yeah, we questioned early on whether Spike was going to be good enough. We yeah. we were nervous about it all being Spike, and it turns out that at least in a practical point of view, Spike alone that's all you need seems to be all you need, and that that is fortunate. Yes, that's the point yes. I'm trying to make. All right, let's do some email. Brianne, can you take the first one, please? Sure. Um, Sheila writes. Hi, TWIB team. I have been listening to TWIB and Immune for about a year and am still working my way through the fascinating back episodes. I love the podcast as well as the Columbia Bio 4310 and Dr. Barker's immunology course. I do not have a science background and now wish I could go back 30 years and study virology and immunology formally. I feel like I am not understanding something properly in episode 725 with Drs. Ava Harris and Janet Smith. Dr. Harris says that the secreted NP1 protein of dengue itself can cause vascular leakage. She, she says that there is a lot of conserved sequence identity among many flavivirus NP1 structures, so not sure whether they have the same effect. However, much of the rest of the episode discusses using this antigen to create a vaccine. I know that other subunit vaccines can be made with a particular antigen just because it has epitopes that gamma globulins can bind to block infection, but they do not themselves cause pathogenesis, but act more as heralds if memory B or T cells encounter them in a viral invasion after vaccination. 
However, Dr. Harris said that NP1 alone was essentially a viral toxin that causes immune cells to release vasoactive cytokines, starting a cascade that results in the breakdown of the endothelial barrier. If this isolated antigen is so pathogenic and destructive, how can it be used as a subunit vaccine? Is it just that it would be used in a very small amount? I don't recall any discussion of changing any amino acids on it to make it less pathogenic, but preserve immune system recognizability. I cannot figure out what I missed in this discussion. Thank you so much for your wonderful work. I listen all day while walking my dogs, of course, doing housework and driving. This is a photo of one of my dogs sleeping during episode 60, <laughs> making viral RNA, which I am playing and replaying to fully understand. I guess he doesn't find it as fascinating as I do. <laughs> Thanks, Sheila in Silicon Valley. <laughs> he's nonetheless a good dog. Uh, it, yes, you know, yes, he, no, he is. He's, he's meditating on the episode. <laughs> yes, <it is>. Actually, <laughs> those, upright, were, you know. those were his questions. She just sent them in. <laughs> I, noticed, I noticed his ears are kind of perked, you know, even though his eyes are closed. So That's right. That's right. I think the um, idea is that you would make amino acid changes in NS1, right? And uh, the altered proteins would not have the permeability because they know where the antibodies bind to block it and you could make changes there, right? I right. And I also wonder if there's something about the anatomic location where you are delivering this protein as a vaccine as opposed to where it is uh, having access as a virus um, and as part of viremia. Yeah, I was, my assumption during the episode was that it was the small quantity, the delivery location, and also possibly the platform. Um, so, for example, if you use this as a as a vectored vaccine, you might not have this thing secreted. You might have it presented on the surface, or you might have, um, you know, some kind of a particle that's got a bunch of the antigen on the outside, or something like that. But, but yes, you're. It is. It is correct. We sort of elided that whole. <laughs> that whole issue. Here's this horrible toxin. Let's let's use it as a vaccine. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, great question. It is a great question. Yeah, it is. That is. But that there are is. there are lots of uh, immunizations though, that depend on denatured toxins for you know like tetanus and uh, yeah, denatured some being the key term. Yep. Correct. Yep. Yep. Correct. Yep. Yep. That's right. That's yeah. So that yes, right. this is absolutely something that that would be taken into consideration in the vaccine development process, and that is absolutely a very good question that. We we probably could have mentioned something about yeah. in passing. But well, they we they did say they're interested in uh, developing a vaccine, and I think they assumed, yeah. and we understood that uh, they would have to do something to the protein yeah. to neutralize the toxicity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. All right. So Cheryl sends us a. Cheryl writes this. Twiv is a very special asset. Enormous gratitude for your efforts, and she sends a picture of. <laughs> This um, so last time we had some some bands uh, members who were playing in these little tents, and here it is. You can buy it. Um, Giga tent pop up and changing room privacy tent, instant portable outdoor shower tent. And and what they did for the band is they put a clear window right in the front. So this is basically a tent that you can already buy that they adapted for this band so they could play together. I, I think uh, we talked about this on Tuesday, right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah I think so. And we, we talked about the fact that we weren't sure what the use would be for such a tent and whether it would be available elsewhere, but apparently it is used for changing and showers. Um, when camping. Or toilet. Or toilet. So this this must alter the sound of the music, though, too. It has to pass through the wall of the tent in order to get out, right? But if yes. you're singing into a mic and you've got electric instruments. Well, that's different. That's a, that's right. Yep. That's true. I, I have a funny reaction to this tent. I I mean, are you really camping? <laughs> <laughs> so part of camping is being out naked in the woods, okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is just for changing and showering. You're right. You don't sleep in this thing. No, this right. is for yeah. this is for use at the beach or some other place or a campground where there are other people around and you don't want to be naked in the woods with other people yeah, around. Yeah. That's funny. It's cool. All right, Dixon, could you take the next one? Sure can. Susan writes, Hi Vincent. Thanks for all your work in fighting the scientific ignorance that at times really feels like it's taking over. I'm an engineer by over education, but a scientist at heart, I took Genetics 160 from Ariella Temin back in 1991, but that was about it for my biological science background until now. 
like so many people, I found the mainstream coverage of the pandemic to be, well, let's say wanting. Your lectures, podcasts, and live streams are a great way of filling in the gaps and learning cool stuff, too. In one of your podcasts, you were lamenting that you aren't reaching that many people. As someone pointed out at one time, your influence goes beyond just those who tune in directly. I, for example, am a senior board member of the local recreation Ultimate Frisbee organization, and your podcast helps me to make decisions on how and when to restart our athletic leagues. Our league is one of the largest in the country, so you can add our 4,000 or so participants to the list of people you've affected, directly or otherwise. Keep up the good work. Best, Susan. P.S. I've ordered the, t the TWIV tote bag, but I have no idea of how big it is. I suggest adding the dimensions to the product description. I'm surprised she doesn't finish her um, letters by saying back at you. Ryla Temin, of course, it was the is the wife of uh, Howard Temin. Yes, Howard Temin, who I knew in Rockefeller, indeed. You did? I did. What was he doing there? The virus work, I guess. I don't know. Probably virus work. <laughs> I wish I knew, but I would be smarter for the experience, but I didn't pay attention. So let me take this next short one from Scott. Uh, we had asked a while ago um, what kind of questionnaire the you are you get if you're in a Novavax trial, in particular relating to taste and smells. So Scott sends us a screen cap of, I, I guess, the app uh, that you use to report your daily uh, symptoms. We have check boxes for severe fatigue, new onset generalized muscle or body aches, headache, new loss of taste or smell, congestion or runny nose, nausea or vomiting. So there you go. They're asking about taste or smell. That's actually something we brought up, right? Rich, can you take the next one? Ivan writes, I wonder if you and the group could comment on a few things. One, I enjoyed your discussion of the New England Journal of Medicine article on the COVE study of the Moderna vaccine, including the discussion about uh, same arm versus opposite arm for the boost. The question of germinal centers in the local lymph nodes versus elsewhere, et cetera. When I read the paper last night, I noticed that on page 495, the study pro protocol was that the second shot would be given in the same arm. I didn't see data reporting regarding compliance with this, and I noticed that same arm is not part of the CDC instructions. I have volunteered at the vaccination site set up, uh, set up by my hospital, and there was no directive given uh, no directive to give the boost in the same arm. Intuitively, I would choose the opposite arm to minimize local side effects unless that adversely impacted efficacy. I don't know that it does, since, but since we are trying to adhere to evidence-based practice, is it fair to say the same arm works? Uh, we don't know if the opposite arm does, right? Uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, Ivan has several questions, so I'm going to uh, do these one at a time. Um, you know, well, we have said several times before that you stick with what the trial did and those, the, that's what, those are the data you have. Uh, and so his conclusion, same arm works, we don't know about opposite arm, that would be correct according to uh, the way the trial was done. I have to say, uh, that in my own personal experience, I've now had uh, a prime and a boost with Moderna. I was asked which arm I wanted it in on uh, my f uh, first visit and on my second visit. They never even asked me and stuffed it in the uh, other arm. <laughs> so, uh, Brian, do you have any comment on this? I remember this discussion before as to whether, you know, <clears throat> shouting out to the same lymph node uh, the second time would make a difference. Yeah, I, I don't think that it would make a difference. Um, so I remember we talked about a paper in a past episode where they were comparing an mRNA-based va vaccine and a protein-based vaccine. And I, I remember really liking that paper. And they were measuring the germinal centers in the spleen, um, which isn't local to any of either of the places of administration, yet they saw lovely germinal centers. Um, and so I assume that if we're seeing germinal centers in the spleen, then we really don't care about just that one local lymph node. Right. That's my that's my theoretical idea, but I would agree uh, with Ivan that 
based on what we know from the trials, um, it is fair to say the same arm works and we don't know about opposite arm, um, though we also don't know about compliance in some of these things. So when we get a couple of years out and we're talking about uh, the uh, effectiveness, what, what? Efficacy. <sighs> Oh, effectiveness yeah, but no, is wait a minute. In, effectiveness, effectiveness is in the real world, yeah. Is in the real yeah. world, yeah. okay? If we wind up with two data sets, we can go back and ask them about their arms. <laughs> if they remember. <laughs> so this brings up a question that we got the other night. Um, a guy said his wife didn't have her, her um, armpit lymph nodes because of surgery, so should she be oh. immunized somewhere else? And I guess the answer is it shouldn't matter, right? Yeah, it shouldn't I matter. I don't think it should matter, no. Yeah, okay. Uh, two, in a recent episode of TWIV, there was discussion, banter, about making vaccination involuntary. I think Dixon may have said something about criminalizing refusal. I'm all for vaccinations, but it seems to me that the threshold of evidence for safety has to be very, very high before you can consider that extreme step. Don't get me wrong. I am promoting it as a doctor and as a medical director, and as a parent, and as a child of elderly parents, et cetera. But even the FDA panel that approved the EUAs did not do so unanimously. Before you lock up lay people who are hesitant, let's address the concerns of the two or three scientists on the panel who voted no. That might be an interesting discussion for TWIV. I doubt these are anti-vaxxer kooks. Um, yeah, you know, historically, there have been attempts at uh, legally enforcing vaccination, and mm, they don't always go well. <laughs> this this is something that can be done in very narrowly defined contexts. Um, yeah, I was thinking more hospital workers were in contact with lots of older patients, for instance. I mean, if those people don't agree to get vaccinated, then you either lose your job or you get vaccinated. You know, there are there are hospitals that have implemented in their medical systems, uh, multi-hospital, multi-clinic medical systems that have implemented um, something very close to mandatory immunization for flu shots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now that's based on a vaccine that's less efficacious, uh, but <laughs> the the way it's usually implemented is not you get fired if you don't get a shot because there's a whole bunch of labor law that makes it unlikely you could do that. Um, but the uh, the way this has been handled traditionally is you either get a shot or for the duration of flu season, you have to wear a mask mm -hmm. everywhere right. in the hospital. Right. Now, of course, that doesn't really matter these days because everybody wears a mask in the hospital <laughs> everywhere. Um, but this has been a standard thing at many hospitals and, and clinics for a while. And it's it's similar in other settings where you can have a stipulation if there's a, if there's sound data for what you're doing and you can say, okay, we're going to require this. And if you don't comply, you have to do this alternate thing. Um, the other place that I've encountered it is school systems. Um, it is now mandatory in Massachusetts for kids going to school to get a flu shot unless they get a medical excuse, which is not easy to come by, uh, which I favor. You know, but it's not, you're not going to get locked up if you don't get a flu shot. You just can't go to the school. I didn't mean locked up. I, I don't mean to sound so draconian in my well, no. attitude. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that, that when a pediatrician, for instance, um, says that uh, it's up to you as to whether you want your child to be vaccinated or not, I think that pediatrician is doing more harm than good. And they take an oath not to do harm. But it well, is up to you whether you get your child vaccinated or not, regardless of what the pediatrician says. Yeah, but the pediatrician gave you a very strong pe recommendation. Yes. And, they, <laughs> or, and there are there are many pediatricians who will take it a step further and say, well, it's up to you if you vaccinate your child, but if you don't, you need to find another pediatrician. Exactly. I was just going to follow up with that. That's true. That is true. And that's I, I, usually, oh, okay, I'll vaccinate my kid. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that in this situation, um, before we sort of get into some of these uh, types of um, rules or what have you, um, we've got to make sure that we are ensuring vaccine access equitably yes. um, before we go anywhere near any of this stuff. Yeah. Um, right. The vaccine has to be easily accessible for everyone before yeah. we say anything to you about having not received it. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of premature discussion about no, 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 I, I it totally should it be compulsory. And, and there's another, there's this discussion lately about vaccine passports, which some nations are actually starting to implement oh, for absolutely travel. absolutely right. Um, uh, which right. I think is 
completely premature at a point when most people can't even get this shot. Yep. Right. So, Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. I, I, I have another concern personally. This is just my sort of observation or feeling is that we have enough a uh, problem with vaccine hesitancy and given the sort of uh, cultural mind state in the U.S. that if you were to try and uh, 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 legally require people to get vaccinated, the blowback from that would be more damaging than yes. not doing it. No, no, I agree, but there is blowback anyway from these numbers that we were mentioning before in terms of uh, uh, the ability to prevent hospitalization and yes. death, yeah. that number is about the same for all the vaccines that are on the market right now. But there's a difference in the prevention of disease not being hospitalized between some of the vaccines. And that difference is being magnified out of proportion so that you've got the uh, governor of Iowa sitting there getting the Johnson & Johnson vaccine to prove to everybody it's a good vaccine. It's only one shot. It's only going to be 86% of, you know, uh, the numbers have been um, grossly exaggerated by the press to mean something that they don't mean. And that creates apprehension among the public as to whether they should even take the vaccine or they can say, hey, you guys got the good vaccine. We got the bad vaccine. And there's no such thing as that right now, at least. Well, maybe not with the ones that are on the market that we know about. So that I mean, there's a lot of mythology here, right, that needs to be uh, corrected. And that's why we're on the air, I guess. So uh, for the record. Whenever you can get whatever's available. get whatever's offered. What does it here, say, here, uh, here. Brienne? Don't what? Don't don't throw away your shot. Don't, don't do throw not. away your shot. Don't pass on the pass. <laughs> okay, number three. I try to be evidence based, and I appreciate Dr. Fauci and others who point out that we don't have much data regarding efficacy of a single dose of either mRNA SARS-CoV-2 vaccine saying the curve is flat for 12 days is far from conclusive. As Brianne essentially said, the production, the protection from one dose might fall off after, uh, fall off a cliff X weeks after immunization, but I doubt it. On the other hand, vaccinating half as many people is almost certainly really bad. Therefore, I agree with the British approach in quotes, to emphasizing the first dose in the population. If we can get 100 million people one dose, that is very likely to be better than getting, getting 50 million people two doses, at least in the short run. We're not saying never give the second dose, but let's leave fewer people without any protection. If it turns out that one dose is not durable, we will begin to see it and we can change course. Everything I've said about uh, boosting, which is a lot less than you guys have said, is that there is a, oh, everything I've read about boosting, which is a lot less than you guys have read, uh, is that there is a minimum wait of three weeks. There's no intention of a maximum wait. Am I, uh, I am sure that exists in theory, although greater than 10 years for DTAP is a standard. I know there is a minimal data. Uh, there is minimal data for waiting longer than 21 or 28 days, but those intervals were selected, I think, to try and get the study done quicker, not because they were likely optimal. I think the British approach makes sense in a pandemic. In an emergency, you sometimes have to shoot from the hip. Basically, I agree. First of all, I think it's in, and we've I think discussed this before that those were, uh, those are the. Boost intervals are minimum times that you need to sort of uh, uh, prepare yourself for a memory response um, and that they were probably set up that way to get the trial done as soon as possible. Uh, that we don't know what the maximum is, but it's probably uh, quite, I, you know, weeks, months. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I think, you know, boosted within a year probably yeah. is going to be fine. Please. And, you know, uh, uh, my, my guess is that, well, I won't go further. I don't disagree with what you're saying. We say, you know, formally stick with what the trial did. Okay. Yes. But everything you say makes sense. It, it does. And that's, that's part of the pitfall here. I mean, we were just discussing which arm you get it in, which yeah. I think is a really uh, actually kind of a trivial issue. And as Brienne pointed out, the spleen is 
doing the work probably anyway. So it doesn't even matter if, if you get it in your leg. Um, but now you're going and mucking with the schedule. And what we have data for is three-week separation for the Pfizer vaccine, four-week separation for the Moderna vaccine, one shot for the J&J vaccine. Now, would it work on a different schedule? Would it? Yeah, probably. I mean, we're pretty sure based on first principles that this would all be okay. Um, but, you know, you, you pull this kind of thing in the airplane cockpit, you're becoming a test pilot. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's probably okay, but that's not how you want to fly. I mean, this is also, it depends on the country, right? Here in the U.S., if we did this, we can't even get what we have into people's arms, right? We're having trouble with that. So if you That's said, right. Right. you know, let's vaccinate more people, we can't even vaccinate people with the first dose. And finally, you know, supposedly we're all going to be vaccinated by the, at least adults by the end of May. So if you make more vaccine, which is what we're doing here, and I guess the UK can't do, uh, you can get around that. So it's a country by country basis, really. I and like it, his uh, I like his bit about in an emergency, you sometimes have to shoot from the hip. And I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of, well, the classic is the Leon Spinks quote. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My plan is not to get punched in the face again. <laughs> uh, four, the other guidance I find confusing is ignoring previous infection and considering whom to prioritize for vaccination. I had the disease in March. I had a high titer of S antibodies uh, by the Mount Sinai test, and I donated plasma. In the context of a shortage of doses, I think it's unethical for me to get the vaccine when there are others who are not immune. There is no question uh, that uh, we see reinfection. Some of what we think is reinfection is not, as you have discussed at length on TWIP, but some is. Anecdotally, what I see in the emergency department is way less than 5% of people, even though some have had undetected primary infection, which would make you think, which would make our estimate lower than the real number. I certainly cannot give you a precise number, but every one of my colleagues I have asked would peg the number way below 5%, which is the failure rate of the two mRNA vaccines with EUA. Therefore, natural infection is likely more effective than vaccine, which is almost always the case, right? So it looks like a duck. It quacks like a duck. It's a duck. If there is a shortage of vaccine, emphasize the people who have not had the infection first. Uh, I will get mine when everybody else who is willing has had theirs. So my immunity may wane, but so might it wane after the vaccination. My Mount Sinai antibody titers may be low now. They almost certainly are unless I've been re-exposed, but, uh, but that is what is supposed to happen. Memory B cells and all that jazz, basic science. Also, in my world, titers are a proxy. What matters is disease. Once again, all true. Okay. Uh, the, the thing here, I, though, I can't. Go ahead. Sorry. No, you go ahead. Um, what was I going to say? I forgot. Go ahead. I'll, I'll remember. Uh, 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 well, you uh, both go ahead <laughs> simultaneously. I mean, the logic is impeccable. If you've been, if you've had the disease, you're probably immune. I've, I, I. I th I think of the vaccinating people who've had the disease in the same way as I think of uh, vaccinating all infants with the Hep B vaccine, as opposed to trying to figure out which ones are at risk. Okay, because when they were uh, the reason you vaccinate all infants in that, even though only a small uh, proportion are genuinely at risk for hepatitis B at birth is that it doesn't work if you try and be selective because you don't get everybody. All right. And the only way to be absolutely uh, sure that you pick up everybody is just to say, you know, forget about that restriction, just vaccinate everybody. Because uh, I mean, 
yes, is everybody who was symptomatic for uh, uh, that might have had COVID? Exactly. Are they PCR positive? If they were PCR positive, were they positive enough to really have high titers? Blah, 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 blah. Forget it. Just vaccinate everybody. I agree. That, my guess yep, is that's totally. basically the strategy. Yeah, that's that's my feeling as well, is that it's really a logistics thing of we don't want to try to sort of do the logistics of trying to figure out who and shouldn't get vaccinated, just vaccinate everybody. Um, I think that Ivan's ethical, you know, feelings um, are really great of him. Um, and I think that him saving a dose for someone else is, you know, makes sense. But I think it's a logistics thing is why we have that recommendation. Also, Ivan, I plan to steal the phrase memory B cells and all that jazz um, for use when I'm talking about some general immune responses later on. <laughs> all right. So I agree that just vaccinate everyone because we don't want to fool around with finding out who's infected or not. Uh, if, you, if Ivan wants to wait, that's fine. But as I said before, we can't even vaccinate people with the doses we have. You know, no state is putting 100% of doses into arms. So what's the difference to save it for someone else? If there were a shortage, I would say sure, but there isn't. There's more vaccine than going into arms. All right. Well, there is also a shortage. I mean, there's there's the there's the issue of the backlogs in states, and some states have actually done really well and, and are getting close to 100% as soon as they arrive. But a lot of states, you know, they got extra doses sitting around, but they're also not getting enough doses for the appointments that they've scheduled, and they've got to schedule the well, second doses, and they're whatever. sometimes blowing but, off the second doses in order to give first doses. But yeah, you're right. It's a mess. And the thing is, apparently we're going to have more vaccine soon, and so this is a non-issue. If, if we only had one company making 10 million doses a year, it would be an issue, but that's not the case. All right. And, but the other thing I wanted to say— I think this is brilliant. Titers are a proxy. We are putting yeah. way too mm -hmm. much emphasis on antibody titers and neutralizing variants with convalescent serum. Hey, what yes. the hell happened to T cells, folks? <laughs> I mean, yes, there's have been some, there have been some lovely T cell preprints about the variants this week. <laughs> we have Alessandro Setti coming on in a couple of weeks. He's on one of those preprints. Um, which is why this the J and J worked really well in South Africa, probably because of T cells. And don't the hell with the neutralization titers against the variants. That's that's he's right. What matters is disease. And I think that's, I would go even further and say <laughs> what matters is hospitalizations and death. Yeah, that's probably it. Yes, you're here. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You get mild yeah, keep, disease. Keep it doesn't me, matter. Keep me alive and out of the hospital, and yeah. and don't let me get really, really sick. And if, then it works fine. I'll stock up on um, hankies. Yes. <laughs> Five antibody tests. We have the Abbott Ig te uh, Abbott IgG test in our lab. This is to the N protein. For some reason, even though I was PCR positive with a high IgG titer versus S at Mount Sinai. I was negative three times by Abbott. My lab director ended up getting my serum uh, tested by other platforms, and I was positive for S by s several others. I was reported to the FDA as an Abbott uh, failure. My goodness. I, I often think I would make you? a terrible Abbott, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know you spoke recently about being able to differentiate natural immunity from vaccination using N versus S antibodies, but it is worth noting that we really don't know what the sensitivity is of these tests. Numbers are quoted, but you, but you uh, tell me a good gold standard when given the enormous rate of asymptomatic uh, infection, and I'll stop pastoring you. Oh, once again, agreed. Ivan, you're right on the money with all this stuff. All right, can I ask you to clarify? I agree that we don't have a good gold standard antibody test, but what does asymptomatic infection have to do with it? I don't understand that last point. Given the enormous rate of asymptom... What does that have to do with a gold standard test? Do you know? Do you get that? I think his idea is that if you have asymptomatic infection, perhaps you have low enough levels of antibodies and you would test negative. I think that's what he's trying to get at. Okay. Although I'm not sure that, that those antibody level correlations are as yeah. uh, definite as all that. I agree. I'm not sure that that's the case. Yeah. So uh, Ivan, as he, oh, he says, thanks again for your service to me and the world of knowledge. Ivan uh, is, as he said, a doctor. He's a medical director of a department of emergency medicine in Westchester. 
Well, I'm impressed that Ivan's listening at all, you know, so thank you, and we appreciate your yeah, comments. Uh, appreciate the uh, comments and the, and the input. It's great. But, I mean, the, the idea about N, I mean, in theory, N should tell you if you've been infected, right, <laughs> versus immunized. Uh, if the tests are no good, hey, that's not our problem, is it? <laughs> yeah. There are multiple <laughs> tests for N available, so you may be able to find it on one of them, but it also depends on how much antibody you produced against N. And as we've talked about, that there's a diversity of responses that, yeah, maybe you just didn't have a high titer against N, but you got over the virus. Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Carla writes, I've never done well in my science classes except social science, but the COVID crisis took me to TWIV at the beginning of the pandemic. I listen to almost every word, but sometimes have to tune out when it gets too technical. I'm a clinical social worker and a tennis player, as well as the wife of an 81-year-old, though I'm much younger. We live in Utah, so we're indoors for tennis in the winter. I chose Monday at 7.30 a.m. for bubble time for tennis, thinking that virus would be lowest since the bubble closes at 3 on Monday. I'm not sure what this procedure is. Uh, now I've been thinking what happens to virus that's been aerosolized if it doesn't make it into a host. How long does it stay around? When can it be kicked up by a fan or people moving about and get back in the air? Okay, so the last part, uh, this for different viruses, it's different. If this was measles, I would say, you know, just don't go to that facility for another couple of days. Um, but for SARS-CoV-2, we don't have any indication that this is something that's going to hang around for a long period of time on surfaces or survive floating around or be carried, you know, in very, very light aerosols, long distances. They, we'd, and by this point, we would know, right? I mean, infection rates, we would have closed everything and people would still be getting infected because it blew in through the neighbor's window. Um, and we just, we don't see that. So I, I don't think that's a big concern here. I'm not sure... What this means, though, uh, your bubble time and the virus bubble closing at three. Um, so whatever, I don't know what the. Um, yeah, what maybe she meant Friday. Maybe it closes. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Friday, yeah, maybe it closes at like three that. on Friday, and uh, but I, bubble time maybe like you have to choose. Everybody goes at that. You're in a group that everybody goes at that particular time, and that defines your bubble. Is maybe uh, I don't know. I think that's something like that would be happening. Yeah. I mean, my, my daughter's tennis academy is set up so that, well, she goes at the same time every day because that's the whole group that goes at the same time. But they just, they do it with distancing and masks and ventilation. And yeah, it's indoors, but um, it's, if you've ever seen an indoor tennis court, it's a huge indoor space that's very drafty. It's a bubble, uh, isn't it? It is. Uh, well, it's not. It's not one of those inflatable ones. It's a. It's the warehouse metal style. Oh, but no. some maybe she refers to a bubble because it really is an inflatable one. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's kind of what right. I was thinking. That's yeah. Right. Yeah, but I figured she meant it closes like a few days before, and I think that's probably right. And opens on Monday, yeah. so it's had time to settle. I mean, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Let's but in do general, I don't think I don't think you need to worry about the virus hanging around for hours. Let's do a couple more, Brienne. You are next. Sure. Mary writes, hi, TWIV team. I thought you might be interested in these UK challenge trials that will start soon. I know that you have talked about the ethics of these trials and wonder if you are still feeling the same about them. Thanks again for everything that you do. Um, and Mary gives us a link. Uh, Mary is a part-time veterinarian in Ottawa, Ontario, where it is currently minus 18 Celsius, minus four Fahrenheit. Um, I, I do not have positive feelings about the, the challenge trials. Um, because I think that we don't know enough about sort of long-term effects of infection. Um, I think that we see some problematic effects in people who are in these young age groups. It's less severe, not completely unsevere. Yeah. Um, and we don't know enough about what's up with long COVID. Yeah, I think that's the real one, right? Because we have monoclonals that we could give patients if they get really sick or, but we don't know what's going to happen. Maybe they get but long plus, COVID. I, they're not going to get a really relevant data in a timely fashion, right? It's going to take them a while to get, it's going to take them quite a while to even get relevant data on this uh, population of young, healthy individuals. Yeah. Okay. And, and, you know, you want to, you want data on a broader spectrum of the population and you want it now. And so, as, as Daniel says, young people can die. 
of yeah. COVID-19. You bet. You know, I think you it's bet. kind of, I'm not sure what the word is. If you click on this link, you see this this young guy sitting on a bed. He's playing on his laptop. He's having a great time. He's playing video games. He's, yeah, it's, it looks like it looks like a nice, you know, dorm room type of setting. It's, it's a hostel misleading. room, but it's a, why don't they, yeah. why don't they have a picture of a scary needle, right? Alan? <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's what they always do with the vaccines is big, scary needle. Um, Some red fluid in it. Neal writes, you may have touched on this. I'm curious if biological as opposed to intellectual property constraints apply to the resulting efficacy when multiple vaccines and types are combined to hedge your bets. In case I need to clarify, I mean, the shingle shot like uh, measles, mumps, rubella. Still delighted to have discovered you all. You know, this still makes me nervous. <laughs> I am no longer delighted to have met. Right. <laughs> That's the next letter. Right? Exactly right. Um, there, there can be biological interference for sure among different viruses, which is why you would have to test any combination that you think is appropriate. If, I think a number of years ago in the U.S., they combined inactivated polio vaccine with DTaP, right? And um, they had to test it to make sure that one wouldn't interfere with the other. So yeah. So, so sometimes people read hear about these things and they think it's it's terrible that it's way more antigens than you could handle at a given time. Um, and that part is not really true. You probably see thousands at a low amount of antigens every day, and a vaccine is some much smaller number of them. And so it's not that you can't make that many immune responses at a time, it's something else. Um, and you have to test it exactly as Vincent said to figure it out. But it's not like in general, having multiple antigens at a time is a problem. Dixon, can right. you the key thing is is balancing so something doesn't swamp something else. I mean, I know with MMR, they had to do a bunch of preclinical animal studies to figure out, well, which concentration, dial this one up, dial this one down so that you get a, so that you actually get a response to all three of them. Dixon. Yes, Jesse writes, dear Trevixianados, I guess that's how you pronounce that. Yeah. I've been a participant in the Moderna phase three trial since last June. It has been very interesting. Recently, as you've heard from other participants, the trial coordinators, or, yeah, coordinators and Moderna have offered participants the chance to be unblinded, find out which groups they were in, and if placebo received the actual vaccine. I'm choosing to remain blinded for several reasons, including I'm pretty sure I got the vaccine based on the reactions I experienced. Whichever group I'm actually in, it wouldn't change my life much since my wife probably won't be vaccinated for a while, and I won't want to take a chance of spreading SARS-CoV-2 to her by uh, in a, engaging in risky behavior. It's better for the long-term trial science for people to remain blinded. However, the people running the trial at my local site keep bugging me to get unblinded. I just had my six-month check-in last week. I asked if I was the only one still, unbl still blinded, and they said yes. I'm assuming that's only my site, but who knows? I guess I really can't blame people for wanting to make sure that they have a vaccine as soon as possible, but it's getting a little disappointing. <clears throat> it seems like there's not much point for me to be the only one blinded. What do you think? Thanks for all you do, Jesse. I would go unblinded, I think. Well, what's to hurt? I don't what's the, I what's, think. So this it gets is you a, out of the trial. It, when, once you're unblinded, you're yeah, out of the trial, maybe, right? Maybe, maybe. Maybe he I've, just likes the social contacts. <laughs> remember, Cole Offit said he thinks maybe some of these vaccines are never going to be licensed, which means you don't have to finish your phase three data collection. Yeah. So maybe Moderna's yeah, right. thinking, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you're the only one at your site, but you don't know what's going on at other sites, that's a I tough would, call. I would say, yeah, I would say go unblinded. Um, I sure. mean, the... If a bunch of it, first of all, the people running the trial and the company have said, we're offering this to you, which tells you they don't need you to stay blinded for the sake of their science. They have proven right. the point they needed to prove. That's right. If they need to know anything else about this vaccine, they've already got a multi million patient deployment that they can mine for data. And they, they're looking at that. I mean, they're monitoring closely mm -hmm. for safety mm -hmm. issues, and, and that's going to be tracked. Long term, that's called a phase four. You can go and analyze those data, much bigger data set. So no worries about the science. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, if you if you're unblinded and whether you whether you got the vaccine or not, if you subsequently get it, um, 
your notion of keeping your behavior the same is spot on. Yeah, right. you know, certainly wait until the all clear sounds before you go out and and do the things you used to do. Um, but it'd be nice to know. Uh, yeah. Rich, can you take the next one? Amanda writes, <clears throat> excuse me here. Okay. Hi, Twivers. <clears throat> I am in a slowly warming Arkansas. It's been below zero C for days, but now the temp is up to 10 C and thawing. I have a story similar to the one Paul Offit shared. I'm a clinical pharmacist and I've been helping vaccinate to vaccinate and giving vaccine advice. A friend called me a few weeks ago and asked for advice about her 92 year old mother. She had booked her a vaccine appointment, but told me she was unsure since her mom had Alzheimer's and was homebound even before COVID and had some real issues going on. She said she had to call her MD, but they wouldn't call her back. I told her I would wait on the vaccine because there is no sense in get in mom getting out and that she should try to get vaccinated herself as a caregiver and practice the safe distancing and masking that she had been doing. She agreed. She said she would take my advice and canceled the appointment. Her MD eventually called her back and advised her to wait until spring two. The mom died the following week from organ failure. Had she kept the vaccine appointment, she would have been included in the vaccine-related death statistics, and her daughter might have never trusted vaccines again. To be honest, I would have felt horrible too and maybe blamed the vaccine myself. It's hard to convince yourself with data when the anecdote is someone you know. I've been sharing this story with all my colleagues who say, but what about the deaths in Norway? When you look at a general population of fragile older folks, there are going to be some who die, whether we vaccinate them or not. Keep up the good work. Love the show. Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. That's a, that's a really great story. I um, <clears throat> One of my, my, I think my favorite gardening podcast is Hidden Brain. And I just listened to an episode about risk. Uh, and how people evaluate risk and how people are really, it's the general population is really miserable at really calculating risk and they assess risk on an emotional level, not on a, a logical level, which we've talked about before. The way to appeal to people who are anti-vax is not with numbers, but with stories. And this is a great example. All right, Alan. Okay, Karen um, writes, my New Year's resolution is to send you a long overdue thank you for all that my husband and I have learned from you this past year and for all the pleasure of listening in on your shop talk. Please take these four items as standing in for a whole bundle of, of things that have captured our attention. One, may I offer a correction to Dr. Griffin's, Griffin's comment on water-soluble vitamins. Um, gives the episode citation. I learned the hard way that the Goldilocks effect apl applies to vitamin B6. If you take too much of this vitamin, the excess does not get peed out. The experience prompted this peer-reviewed essay. Uh, gives a citation. Um, which she wrote, I presume. Which she, yeah, I guess she wrote. Uh, and I have not read this. What is the... No, it's so was this a vitamin B toxicity issue? Yeah, yeah. Be careful. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, don't eat polar bear liver either. Um <laughs> is that is that vitamin B or is that vitamin A? It's vitamin A. That's vitamin A. Sorry. Uh but that's another one that you will not simply excrete the excess. Correct. Um it's second fat soluble. Uh right, right. Uh second, thanks for your thank you for the conversation with Robert Fullalove, Twiv 655. I had the good fortune to meet Bob decades ago in Berkeley. His insights and methods for raising the graduation rights of African-American students at Cal by helping them form study groups groups uh, continue to influence the way I mentor high school kids in Trenton in science. Uh, three, thank you and fellow TWIV addicts, Gina and Joe, for the listener pick on 681 COVID-Fantute. Um, <laughs> we are helping to go viral. 
Before, thank you for introducing us to the co-authors of Principle of Virology, 5th edition on TWIV 662. I gave the text an odd kind of plug on a listserv for historians of the, um, of the book. See below. By the way, my Princeton Research Forum colleague Joan Goldstein interviewed Anne-Marie Skalka on Backstory on Princeton Community TV and gives a Vimeo link <laughs> at minute 16. Dr. Skalka deftly used the book's cover picture to explain the workings of antibodies on the viral spike to a lay audience. With continuing thanks, Karen and Jim in Princeton. P.S. A gift for the parasitologists. This is you, Dixon. Drawings of Entozoa by Dr. St uh, Thomas Spencer Cobold. 1828 to 1886 from the Linnaean Society of London's collections. They are gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. This they are. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a listener pick. Should we do this with picks? Sure. Okay. And so I Somebody's will, copying that down. I will move it down. Yeah. So let's right. do... Anyway, thank you, Karen. That's lovely. Thank you. Yes. Very nice. All right. Time for some picks. Uh, we will start with Dixon de Pommier. Dixon, you're muted. Okay, fine. Listen, there you go. <laughs> you'll thank me later when you come to editing. <laughs> 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 this is a, a fabulous series of animal pictures. I'm attracted to them no matter who produces them. But in this case, they're animals all doing something. And it's it's remarkable how people have the patience and the talent to snap it at just the right moment. And I, I'm, I'm, again, enthralled by biodiversity, and this is my homage to that. I didn't, know, cool. I didn't know what orangutan meant. Did you know uh, that? Orange. It's a French word for orange. No, really. in Malay language, it means man of the forest. Ah. And I just really like the picture ah. of that orangutan. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, they're Very wonderful nice. pictures, wonderful pictures. Brianne, what do you have for us? Um, so I have a website um, called Greater Than COVID. The, the main part of this website is a five-minute long video. Um, and this is made by uh, someone named Kamau Bell, um, whose work you may have heard of elsewhere. Um, it is aimed at uh, black and brown people to talk about uh, answering questions of vaccine hesitancy, although honestly, um, it answers questions that I think anyone might have if they have vaccine hesitancy. And so I think it's good for everyone. Um, and so there's sort of a main video um, where physicians, nurses, and scientists answer his questions um, and sort of hit, hits most of the common questions that people have in a, in a really nice way. And then if you scroll further down the website, there are individual questions um, that you can see written out, and then you can click on little videos to hear the answers to those questions. Excellent. Um, and so if you are talking to anyone who is, uh, you know, is vaccine hesitant and wants to know the answers to different things, this is a site to send them to um, and really spread to a lot of people because this is very, very well done. This is a cool. great resource. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. Ellen, what do you have? Oh, me? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you. Ellen, <laughs> Ellen, what do you have? Yes, that's me. Um, Self-muted. This is a, uh, a report from the World Health Organization um, about responding to infodemics, new term that we're throwing around these days. And it's nice to know that the WHO is thinking about this. Um, so they, they convened a conference and they've, um, they, it was the first global infodemiology conference, which I was not able to attend, um, but they, uh, they called for papers, had a bunch of people get together and discuss this. And this is an ongoing, thing, but there's a bunch of documentation here that talks about the underlying issues and how to address them. And I think um, people, certainly people in my line of work ought to be paying attention to this, at least give it a skim, read the summary, um, and uh, and try and keep up with uh, with how to deal with this. It's, Looks it's, like there's even a new discipline, infodemiology. Infodemiology, <laughs> yes, the study of misinformation <laughs> and how it spreads. Is well, this, I'm, is, glad, I'm glad this is becoming... Uh, uh, a discipline because it's important. Yes. So, yes. Alan, is this just dealing with with bad information or all information? Uh, it's primarily dealing with bad information, but that is a good question. And I think it, infodemiologists will probably need to look into that. How do how do those viral cat videos get spread? But that's a, it's a related... <laughs> 
you know, related kind of thing. Uh, uh, yeah, because uh, you would like to promote uh, spreading good information as yeah. much yeah. as you would sure. like to prevent spreading bad information. Yes. Good point. Yeah, because I could understand that there's a lot of information in general and maybe you want to cut back. Although I don't know how you would cut back, but I think the bad information is the problem, right? Well, and the study the study of spreading information that you want to spread yeah. is already an established field called marketing. Um, and there there are huge, huge quantities of money spent on that. But of course, most yes. of the data are locked behind proprietary paywalls. Um, not even paywalls, just corporate yeah, secrets. Yeah, yeah. So there there but some of that can come to bear on studying how the how the false information is. Spread. Yeah, we uh, on Twiv we don't do any marketing. We depend on being viral. <laughs> yes. It doesn't work out as well, but it's not bad, right? <laughs> it's done. It's done okay this year. It's done okay. Rich, what do you have for us? So I have another pick for the space geeks out there, uh, and uh, preface this by saying that um, uh, we're recording this on a Friday. It'll drop on Sunday. But uh, as we were just starting to record, uh, Kate Rubens and Suichi Noguchi were finishing uh, Kate's "What for Kate" is the second spacewalk of uh, her time on the International Space Station. And uh, I've been hooked on all of this stuff. Uh, and in the process of getting hooked, you know, I'm watching where they're crawling around the station and what they're doing and their reference to all these different parts and, and trying to understand this. I was poking around on the internet and don't click this unless you want to download a 37 megabyte P, uh, PDF. But uh, for all of you ISS nerds out there, this is the reference guide to the International Space Station, a 120-page document that takes you through the entire thing and tells you what everything is for and where it is and everything else, including spacesuits and everything else. And it's marvelous. I love it. I'm probably going to read it cover to cover. <laughs> this is cool. Got a lot of nice pictures of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Great cool. pictures of stuff. And like I said, I got interested because, they, you know, they're going out through the airlock, which is about mid-station, and translating, as they say, all the way out to the end of one of these arms to install these two struts uh, that are going to support some new uh, 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 veins solar panels for a solar upgrade and i'm following them through all this and hearing all this vocabulary referring to their equipment and where they are and what things are for and you know with this thing i can i can interpret all this and understand it and it's fascinating it's very cool Just Good stuff. Fascinating. Neat. all right my pick is a website called 3d molecular designs uh, which will has a lot of resources for uh, teaching uh, not just viruses, but uh, different kinds of molecules and so forth, as the name implies. Uh, you can uh, have them custom print a model for you. And in fact, uh, last year sometime, I think, um, I got an email from this company from Mark Holger. And he said, you want to have any custom designs? I said, yeah, we could use an Entrovirus 68 uh, design. So he 3D printed it for us. It's um, about the size of a cantaloupe. And he had it open up so that you could see the inside. It's very beautiful. I gave it to Amy. It's in the lab over her uh, bench. Um, but then he sent me free uh, his SARS-CoV-2 model that he's been working on. I have pictures here, but I'm going to get it and show it to you guys. Yeah. I don't know if I've showed you shown you this before, but um, so it's several pieces um, put together. Um, you know, the 3D structure of the spike was used to uh, create this. You can see here. Then he made a um, the membrane, uh, and then he has embedded in it a few of the other viral proteins, like the E protein, and they're based on structures as well. And then he's got it cut in half, uh, so he he made this foam wire model of the RNA, which he stuffed inside. It's kind of cool. You can pull that out. But what I really like, he's got an antibody here binding to spike, which is, is he's got little magnets embedded in one of the spikes <laughs> and it will stick to the RBD, which is very cool. But even cooler, he's made a nanobody, a trivalent 
nanobody, nice. oh, right? Great. Which okay, is cool. um, three nanobodies that will bind RBD, and they're joined <laughs> by a couple of strings. And you can add uh, linkers to join these together. The magnets making them all stick. Let me pull them here. So yeah, conformational cool. issue there. there yeah, we do. See, three of them together, and you can uh, bind them to the epitope. So you could take the antibody off uh, and put the nanobody on instead. And it's kind of a nice way to, to show students how the uh, the antibodies, nanobodies work. And then the whole thing is— What would such an item like that cost, Vincent? Uh, it's, uh, um, hold on. This is stuck on the base by magnets as well, three three different positions. Um, I don't know. He gave this to me. Right. Um, and the, the, ba the base is an ACE2 receptor? <laughs> you're now, Vincent, you're now doing yeah. an ad for him, so I think that this it's is an uh, ACE2. You know, like payback. <laughs> it's an yeah, ACE2. I, I really like that a lot. <laughs> uh, you can go buy it. This is for hint, sale. Hint, hint. Um, I might have to look at that. He did, not, he did not tell me to advertise. He just wanted to give me a gift because... The the Entro sixty eight was rather expensive, um, not not impossible, but uh, and he said last year he said, well we're working on a SARS model and I'd love to give it to you and then and I didn't hear anything for a long time and so I emailed him and he sent and he sent this to me and I said you know I'm going to plug your site and because I think this is gorgeous and then he sent me an email of a virus he made which is like three feet in diameter I really want that oh one my God. <laughs> really yeah, is I that a Mimi virus. I don't know what virus. It was probably not because it looked like an icosahedral structure. Anyway, the site has a lot of good resources that are pre-made, uh, as I said. It, but okay, if you, so you, I'm seeing an influenza virus um, that looks similarly complicated for six hundred dollars. Yeah, that's what the uh, EVD sixty eight uh, cost. Yeah, it's expensive. Okay. I mean, for um, you know six inches and in like that, you can make smaller yeah. ones, which will be cheaper. But I wanted to have a. Uh, he's got, yeah, he's got, I'm, I'm in his site here. Uh, it goes from a four inch gray red model for a hundred bucks up to uh, a nine inch model for 700 bucks. And so if you love viruses as I do, you know, 700 bucks is not an issue. I would rather <laughs> not eat for a few weeks than not have that. You know. uh, but somebody have, sending it to you for free is best of all. Oh, this for I have this, to say uh, that this is the best. <laughs> yeah, Mark, I appreciate this very much. And yeah. you can go to the website and buy something to support them because this is what he does. He designs these things and he's really into it. So, Well, and it, this is the kind of thing, I mean, yeah, that that's a lot of money for an individual to spend for a decoration. But if you are um, a professional in the field or you're teaching a lot of classes, you can um, – Maybe get your university to pay for this. That's right. That's the uh, scariest looking visualization of uh, of the virus that I've seen. <laughs> the, the spike, I'm assuming that he's done all this to some reasonable scale. The spike okay. is enormous. This this seems too big to me, the spike, okay? The spike. Well, that's what it's, I was... Uh, I, it's I, enormous. Yeah. In, in it's relation to the, to the diameter of the particle, I think the spike is yeah. too long. Yeah. Okay. I would agree. Okay. I, but the spike is best based on the 3D, but I think it should be scaled down or else I suspect the, the particle should be either much bigger or make a smaller spike. Make right? the spike yeah. smaller, yeah. yeah. So, Vincent, what are those little white dots on them? It's another viral protein, uh, E and... There's two other, yeah, there's two other And there's membrane another proteins. membrane protein uh, there. Uh, I forgot the name of it right now. Um, hold on. I got to look it up in my textbook of. Uh, <laughs> Speaking of advertising things, virology. Yeah, no, no, this is uh, <laughs> principles of virology. So, Brianne, do you have this? I do have it. Okay. Um, coronavirus. Here we go. What is the? So, we, of course, we have the spike. We have uh, the membrane protein, and or M, and the envelope protein or E. So, um, let's see which e is M. which. Uh, the, the envelope looks smaller, so I would say the blue one uh, on the model is probably the envelope and the uh, white one is the um, membrane protein. Got it. Okay. There you go. Nothing like having a reference book <laughs> on hand. You can buy this as a book or as a PDF. It's the only thing I charge for in all the things I do. Okay. So there you go. I have to, I have to eat. Not often, but... Now and then. We have two <laughs> listener picks. Elizabeth writes, Dear Twiv Crew, first, I'd like to say how thankful I am you've been broadcasting 
so much accurate information about COVID-19 over the past year. I wasn't a listener before the pandemic started, but I do teach classes on disease outbreaks. I have a BS in biology and a PhD in medieval history. <laughs> Far out. Cool. So your podcast is a perfect fit for my teaching and personal interests. While listening to a news podcast today, I heard this song played during one of the commercial breaks. I played it for my husband, and he, having listened to every TWIV show for months now, said I should send it to you as he hadn't heard you mention the song. I hope you enjoy it as much as we did. It's a wonderful video of two young girls singing with their father playing guitar. Their voices are wonderful. This is good. Aren't their voices good, uh, Rich? Oh, yeah. Who knows voices? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The coolest part is at the end, the father grabs one of the daughters for like 10 seconds, and then when he lets go, she runs to turn off the, <laughs> the camera because <laughs> he didn't want her to run immediately, right? It was, But their voices are so good. Yeah, so it's good. a beautiful song. And yeah. the, the nice harmony. They really do a good job. I think they have vocal training, don't you, Rich? Who knows? I don't know. Well, they've, you know, they've got all the gack that goes along with recording. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, cl so clearly, uh, this is not just uh, yeah. something that they cooked up in an afternoon. They, they, they work yeah. at this. And then we have a uh, Karen's listener pick around the corner for Dr. Barker's Drew University Lab in Madison. The wonderful little Museum of Trades and Crafts has mounted this exhibition: Cholera to COVID nineteen epidemics, pandemics, and disease. I haven't been able to visit, but part of the show is online, and Karen provides a link to that. That's very cool, Karen. Thank you. I think that I, uh, I'm going to have to put that on my list to head over there very soon. It's not far from you, right? It, it's like right over there. <laughs> <laughs> this looks like a really cool museum. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I really want to see this uh, exhibition, which I haven't seen, and so, so I will be heading over shortly. <laughs> when, when your cat takes you for a walk, you can go over. Okay, I'll do that. <laughs> All right, that's twiv728microbe.tv slash twiv. Send your questions and comments, twiv at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Palmier is at trichinella.org and thelivingriver.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. Been Very good time. Have you been fishing lately? No, sir, but I did buy my New York and Pennsylvania state licenses, so I'm ready to go whenever the season opens. When does it open? In, in April? Um, sometimes it doesn't open. It's a year-end thing for no-kill stretches and, and for the other stretches of rivers. It's usually April 1st to April 15th, something in that area. Thank you for asking. Rich Conda is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He's currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Fair enough. Always a good time. Brian Barker's at Drew University. Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. It was great to be here. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. <laughs> He's Alan Dove <laughs> on <guess>. Twitter. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. <laughs> Thanks. It's always a pleasure. Your daughter likes to get in, you know, at least a short she, appearance. Yeah, well, she came Does. in to get something. She came in to get something off the other desk, and then the cat moved, and then of course she had to pet the cats. So I have to ask you: Does she happens. Does she look at the video to see her appearance later on? I, no, I don't <laughs> think so. I mean, she watches everything else on YouTube and Twitch, but uh, okay. I don't think she ever catches Twiv. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.